enforcement. Historically, men of America's police departments have been strained. The relationship has been strained with their minority communities. And over the past few years, there's been an increased focus on how they can improve. You know, some people think that body cameras are the answer. Uh, some say America needs more diverse police forces. Personally, I think all police should have to always ride segways. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I think it's adorable. And, uh... <laughs> secondly, you can't shoot anyone because you need both hands to steer. You'd be like, free, ah, oh, free, ah! Oh. <laughs> now, just this weekend, presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg, he had to leave the campaign trail to deal with a police shooting in his own city where many residents have blamed racism for how the police treat black people in their own town. But the sad truth is that this is a nationwide problem. In fact, recently, the Plain View Project did a review of the social media posts of police officers across the country, and the findings are already making waves. This morning, the Philadelphia Police Department under fire. 72 of the city's police officers taken off the streets and placed on administrative duty under investigation for allegedly posting offensive and racist statements on social media. The Facebook posts in question contain discriminatory opinions. If our country was all Caucasian, the homicide rate would drop 70%. Perhaps we should be very suspicious of all Muslims in this country, said another. Or encourage violence. It's a good day for a chokehold. Yeah, your reaction is right. Imagine seeing that, the police posting, it's a good day for a chokehold. It's never a good day for a chokehold, all right? Chokeholds don't belong in your workplace. In fact, chokeholds don't belong in any workplace. Like, there's no... Unless maybe you, if you work at the Cheesecake Factory, maybe then. <laughs> yeah. No, after someone's had, like, a slice of cake with 5,000 grams of sugar, that's the only way to calm them down. It's like, sir, please, 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 please! <laughs> I know it's tasty. Calm down. Shh. But this study, this study wasn't just focused on Philadelphia, right? This report reviewed the social media of police officers in eight cities and county, counties, right? And they found, they found in all of these eight cities that out of the 3,500 cops accounts, 853 had posted, posted uh, offensive content. Imagine that, 853 had posted offensive content. Yeah, that's almost a quarter of all of the accounts. And they're just the dumb cops, the ones who put it online. Yeah, because you know the smart cops, the racist ones, they keep it in their DMs. <laughs> so police departments everywhere are realizing that they could have racist cops. And while it is encouraging that cities like Philadelphia are taking them off the streets, the bad news is, elsewhere, they're getting promoted. Controversy in Louisiana where a police officer who shared a racist image on social media has been promoted to chief. Wayne Welsh made headlines in 2017 when he shared a depiction of a white woman pushing a little girl's face into bath water, supposedly as punishment for having a crush on a black child. Yeah, what the f man? I mean, it's not even just that that's a racist meme. The fact that they made that person, the person who posted that, police chief. How do you post something like that and get a promotion? It's like if someone hijacked a plane and the FAA was like, yeah, you've got talent. You want to fly full-time? Come on. <laughs> and I've, I've got to be honest, like, uh, like, I don't know what's scarier than having a racist police chief. I guess the only thing is realizing that in many places, these officers are just a reflection of their communities. The mayor says the meme is irrelevant now because it was posted nearly two years ago, in July of 2017, when Chief Welsh was assistant police chief. He was disciplined, he was dealt with, and, uh, and then he was reelected, ran unopposed. Well, what does it say about the people of this community that they would elect somebody like that? You know, I was not the mayor back at that time. I understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to elaborate on that. Is this town racist? No, it's not. Do you use the N-word? Often, but I don't use it as racist. How is using the N-word as a white man not racist? I don't find it racist. I got plenty of black friends. We all use it. Yeah, we all use it. Yeah, I call my black friends nigger, and they say, stop calling me nigger. <laughs> so the bad news is that racism is extremely pervasive in America's police departments, and people need to acknowledge that. In fact, it's gotten so bad that Philadelphia has had to suspend 72 of their own cops. The good news is... For those cops, there's definitely a town that'll hire you. In the wake of the George Floyd killing, most Americans have now come to realize that the police need sweeping changes. But the question is, why has it taken so long? 
Why did so many people, particularly white people, think until now that police are just fine the way they are? Well, one reason is that most Americans don't actually have much actual experience with police. In fact, in a typical year, only 21% of U.S. adults have any type of contact with police at all. So, I mean, most Americans see the cops less than Trump sees Eric. So, if people don't see cops in real life, how are they forming their opinions about the police? Well, a lot of it comes from the same way I form all my opinions about Klingons. Television, baby. Police dramas are iconic, hugely popular, and now under intense fire from activists who say these shows far too readily portray cops as good and trustworthy I never put a hand on. while undermining real-life claims of systemic racism and abuse. Police not only consult on these shows, but they're also very aware that their portrayals impact public perception, and they have a vested interest in making sure that portrayal is positive. The 2015 study found viewers of crime dramas are more likely to believe the police are successful at lowering crime, use force only when necessary, and that misconduct does not typically lead to false confessions. Yes, believe it or not, watching cop shows makes a lot of people see the police as infallible. And honestly, I don't blame any of these people. I mean, I'll admit, a lot of my perceptions about reality have been shaped by TV as well. I believe sponges wear pants. I believe white people have no black friends. And most importantly, I believe that every kiss begins with K. Now, part of the reason it's easy for TV shows to convince people that cops are always right and always good at their jobs is because that's what we want to believe, right? I think we can all agree that we want people who are gonna enforce laws fairly and effectively so that we don't have to do it ourselves. I know I don't wanna do it. Like, I don't, I don't wanna have to find the person who stole my car. I've got other things to do, you know? I wanna go look for a new car. I don't want the stress of having to find the thief because, I mean, like, what happens when I find them? Do I arrest them? Huh? Do I throw them in prison in my apartment? Huh? Then I have to give them a job in my library and then they educate themselves and get a degree and then they turn their life around and now I'm stuck with an inspirational story on my hands? I don't need that stress! And when you watch these shows, you understand how they can shape public perception. Because according to cop shows, whenever cops are breaking the law, it's only because they have to. We can't just break protocol because we think it's right at the time and expect to get away with it. Normally, I'd agree with you. But in this case, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, as you well know, we will need a warrant to search the house. Agent Callan, these are exigent circumstances. You let me worry about the legal ramifications. If I gotta bend the rules a little bit to get a bad guy off the street, I'm gonna do it, and you would too. Forget warrants, forget the rules. It's on us to catch him. Ooh, that was cool. Although what that guy was actually saying is the Constitution is for pussies. It's amazing how cops and TV shows are always saying that the only way to catch a criminal is by breaking the law themselves. Technically, that cop is now a criminal too, which means another cop should kick his ass. But then that new cop is also a criminal because he's breaking the law, which means another cop should then beat up cop number two. So the third cop beats him up, then a fourth cop has to come in to beat them, then a fifth. Basically, every cop show should end with the entire precinct in a brawl while the suspect just sneaks out of the door. And you see, that, that's what cop shows are really good at doing. They make us believe that the only way the police can truly be effective is if they break the rules that society created to protect us from police. And by the way, when TV cops break the rules, it's not usually by filling form 27G instead of 27B. No, they often do it by beating the shit out of a suspect. But I told you everything. No, you haven't, but you will. I'm gonna beat the balls off you. Please don't let him hit me! Kyle, the only thing on this earth that's gonna stop him from hitting you is you telling the truth. You're gonna tell us what happened. Or I'm gonna do something I won't regret, not for one second. We can do this the fast way, the slow way, then... Smart. Ow! Jeez, you can't. Did you see that? Oh! What shot, Bones? Son of a bitch, I'm gonna fix you right now so you can't love any more kids. You raped them, right? Guess it better! You sure you didn't give him brain damage when you slammed his head against the steering wheel? Ah, uh, Captain Grove, I think brain damage was a pre existing condition. Don't you think, George? I need to see a doctor. Whoa, all at once. <laughs> yeah, 
That guy doesn't deserve to see a doctor. He maybe committed a crime. And even if he didn't commit the crime, well, then this will be a lesson to stop him from committing one in the future. It's the same reason I plan to pre-beat all my children. Cause you might not have done anything yet, but I know you will. It's actually crazy how every cop show has police just regularly using violence to help them do their job. TV doesn't do that with any other profession. There aren't medical dramas where they're like, doctor, this doesn't make any sense. The patient's lab work is normal, but his heart is failing. Well, maybe we need to smack him around a little bit and see what he knows. What? I used to be on a cop show. Every cop show makes it seem like the reason cops have to beat suspects is just because without the beatdown, they won't tell the truth. And so those beatings protect the rest of society from these lying criminals. But in real life, beating a suspect is a great way to get them to confess to something they didn't do, which means you've locked up an innocent person and you've let the real criminal walk free. Oh, and by the way, even if the person did do the crime, their lawyer can get them off because their confession wasn't legitimate because they were beaten. So beating a suspect to solve your case is like washing your computer with water. Yeah, the virus is gone, but so's your laptop. So whether we like it or not, TV is a powerful tool that shapes how the public sees the police, shapes how the public sees the police's role in society and how accountable they should be. Because in real life, when rogue cops throw away the rule book and take matters into their own hands, it doesn't look cool like in one of the TV shows. It looks a lot more like this. The Valdasta Police Department facing a lawsuit this morning for unnecessary and illegal force after arresting the wrong suspect and reportedly breaking his arm in the process. Put your Wait, hands. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Oh, please. Put your I hands. I Oh, my God. That's painful body cam video showing the officers handcuffing and slamming that man to the ground. That was back in February. Antonio Smith stopped for suspicious activity and accused of panhandling, but officials had the wrong man. Smith was released at the scene. Now he's filing a $700,000 lawsuit. You see? Unfortunately, every day in America, there are people who have encounters just like that with the police. And so to all those show creators, directors, and writers in Hollywood who make these cop shows and have been tweeting that something needs to be done about the police, well, one way you can help make a difference is if you do something about the police on screen. Body cameras. They were introduced with the idea that having footage of interactions would make police more accountable, which makes sense because everyone wants to look good if they know other people could be watching. You know, you think the Snapchat hot dog, you think that hot dog is always so happy and upbeat? No, <laughs> you should see him when the camera is off. <laughs> Don't look at me. Don't look at me without the filter. <laughs> but it turns out that some police only behave better if they know the camera is on. You know how sometimes people say, I'm innocent, that car planted those drugs. And you think, sure, cracky. Well, uh, it turns out we might owe Cracky an apology. Video recorded on a Baltimore police officer's body camera appears to show a city officer manipulating evidence. During that time, you see three city officers in an alley. Seconds later, audio of the officers begins to be recorded. I'm gonna check here. Hold on. <laughs> the officer is seen returning to the spot where the three were just standing, picking up a can and pulling drugs from it. The same can that it appears he placed the drugs in seconds earlier. You know what, Baltimore police? I'm not, ang I'm not angry, I I'm, I'm just disappointed. Like, it's one thing to apparently plant evidence. It's another to miss a golden opportunity to look like a super sleuth. Like, you don't just come in and be like, drugs could be anywhere. Found them! You don't do that. <laughs> You've gotta play it up. You come in, you look around. <laughs> you do that thing where you walk away and then you stop and go, oh! Something doesn't add up. <laughs> Is that a can of black olives? The pits of olives are like rocks. Rock's street name for crack. I got it! And then you find the drugs. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> if you're gonna frame people and send them to jail, at least have the decency to put on a show. Especially if you're planning to make this a regular thing. 
For a second time, police officers in Baltimore are suspected of planting evidence in a drug case. And once again, they were exposed by their own cameras. Body cameras were rolling during a traffic stop last November. The video shows Baltimore police officers searching a car for drugs. According to the public defender's office, the officers found nothing in the car until turning their body cameras off. When the cameras came back on, an officer is seen squatting by the driver's side of the suspect's car, apparently unaware that he's being recorded. He then stands up and steps back. About 30 seconds pass, another officer approaches the car. That officer then squats down and pulls out a bag of drugs. You know, I, I'm starting to wonder if the entire drug business in Baltimore is just cops buying drugs to plant them. <laughs> That's all it seems like. This is like cops coming up to dealers like, hey, man, I need some evidence, man. You got some good evidence? Drug dealers like, nah, man, I'm out. Oh, then what's this? Wait, what the f just happened? I guess you just made a sale. <laughs> like, as disturbing as these videos are, black people have known about police planting evidence for years, but nobody believed them. But now there's the technology to prove it. It's sort of like how we've all assumed the hotel room was covered in semen, but then they invented the black light and we were like, holy sh this is a thorough coaching. <laughs> even the ceiling, what's it? Wait, it's on the black light. How did that even happen? <laughs> now look, I know, I know the two videos doesn't prove a systemic problem in policing. Uh, that's Stanford University's job. Researchers at Stanford University collected and analyzed 60 million state patrol stops in 20 states. They found black drivers are issued 20% more tickets than white drivers, and Hispanic drivers received 30% more tickets than other drivers. Hispanic drivers were most likely to be searched, least likely to have contraband. Wow. Hispanics are the ones getting the most racism? That's... That's like finding out the hotel room next door has even more semen than yours. <laughs> no, I mean, part of you is happy, but the other part is like, oh, man, I got the nerd room. Come on. <laughs> now, one of the more interesting pieces of information that came from the Stanford study was that in areas where police regularly make broken taillight stops, stops of black and Hispanic people are both about 20% more likely for broken taillights than stops of white people. So, if you're a minority, who wants to reduce your chances of getting stopped, you've got to make sure your taillight is never out. And if you're thinking, but Trevor, that's impossible, you've clearly never met Leo Deblin. Are you tired of being pulled over for being black? Of course you are. Police make it up all kinds of reasons. Is this car stolen? Do you have a gun? Did you kidnap this white woman that's sitting next to you? And of course their favorite, sir, your taillight is broken. Officer, I might be broke, but my tail light is just fine. With the Leo Devlin Forever Tail Light, the police will have to come up with a better reason to whoop your ass. These other punk ass tail lights break under pressure, but not the Forever Tail Light. This indestructible tail light is made from 100% plexiglass. A light so strong it make a baseball bat say, God damn, plexiglass. That's the same the Pope got on his Cadillac. Now, I know what you're thinking. How did I get my hands on some of that Pope glass? That's none of your goddamn business. What you should be asking me is if it works. Damn right it does. You know why I pulled you over, ma'am? It ain't her tail light. Nope. It's for the brick of cocaine they planted in my car. Thanks, Leo Dublin. With the forever tail light, you ain't never gotta stop for the popo. -po. These police been chasing me for three hours. But I ain't stopping, because I know my tail light good and my white woman leak. It ain't but $85. You can get that from your mama. Black don't crack. Neither should your tail light. Leo Devlin's forever tail light, an institute of Bob Man. Leo Devlin's forever tail light, an institute of Bob Man. Exit 120 by the fairgrounds. Next to Little Caesars. Mis hombres say habla espanol. <laughs>
But in real life, a citizen's arrest ain't no Barney Fife shit. You are a individual that's 20 some odd years of age and individuals are running after you, blocking you in with cars. That's called hunting. That's the wild, wild west that we talked about. This is Georgia State Representative Carl Gilliard, someone who is just as outraged about this as I am. The citizen's arrest law gives individual citizens the right to arrest someone up to 48 hours until law enforcement would arrive. So not only can you citizens arrest somebody, you can just keep them for two days, like misery. Hey, please! People are using laws as a justification for murder, as a justification for lynching. You, you have a higher form of racism. They're not wearing hoods anymore, they're wearing shirts and ties. Yeah, it sounds like a player hater law. I think you're correct. How is this still a law? Well, no one's challenged it. This law was conceived in 1863. You know, it's, it's just, it's outdated. Hmm. What possibly could have been happening in Georgia in 1863? I ask, knowing I won't like the answer. This particular law was written during the Civil War. It was a way of preventing enslaved Africans who were trying to escape to the Union lines. It empowered any white person to arrest any black person. So on the scale of Betty White to David Duke, how racist is this citizen's arrest law? You tell me when to stop. I think it passed David Duke, and that's how racist it is. One of the big things about Georgia is the man in charge of writing the formal laws, Thomas Cobb, is an avid racist. Wait, avid racist? You wrote books justifying racism, basically arguing that African Americans were better off enslaved and could never really function as free people. Oh shit, that is avid. Okay, continue. Cobb himself, he dies in 1862, but the system of law he had established for Georgia lives on. And that becomes the, the basis to protection for racists like the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War, because they could lynch any African American and claim it was a citizen's arrest. How is this still a law? We still have a racist society. We haven't gotten rid of so many elements of racism in the United States. Well, that settles it. I've talked to the experts, I've studied the finest legal texts, and I can confirm this law must be changed. But I have no idea how to do that. Yo, how is this still a law? All these injustices are happening and nobody's doing anything to stop it. I am. Wait, you are? That's why I authored House Bill 1203. You're proposing a law that gets rid of the law that's a terrible law. There are some people that are trying to move forward. Mm, cool. As it turns out, one of the things filling up Carl's cat calendar is a bill to repeal the current citizen's arrest law. And he's getting ready to drop it like it's... Don't say it, Carl. We are getting ready to drop it, you know, like it's hot. Oh, he said it. It's a movement now. The, the old Jim Crow has had a bowel movement, and we're in a whole new movement now. So repealing the citizen's arrest law is a laxative against the Jim Crow constipation that's been holding up the progress of the black man. And what we need to do with that laxative that's it. is add a stand your ground laxative. And then we need to take a no chokehold laxative. And then we need to take a voting registration suppression laxative and get all of that moved out and into the toilet of justice, my brother. Only time will tell if citizens arrest gets flushed into the sewage system of history. But we're definitely a step closer to getting rid of this law for the entire country. No, this is for Georgia. Oh, shit. How many states have a citizen's arrest law? Uh, all of them, with the exception of maybe two. Oh, so we got work to do. We got work to do. Excuse me. Oh, how is this still a law? While states like New York are finally passing legislation that tries to stop police violence, those changes are being resisted by a very powerful force, the police unions. In fact, just listen to the head of the New York police union, Pat Lynch, lashing out at police reform. They're asking us to pull back. 
They're asking us to walk away from you. They're asking us to abandon our communities. They're asking me to walk away from where I live. They're asking me to walk away from where I work. They're asking us to walk away from the neighborhoods <clears throat> that we brought back. And that's what's happening. And you know what? We don't have a choice. If we put our hands on the criminal, you're going to jail. I'm not being dramatic. That's how bad it is. Okay. With all due respect, I, I think you are being dramatic. No policeman is going to jail for touching somebody. This is almost like the police version of those guys during Me Too. Remember those guys who were like, so what, I can't even smile at a lady in the office anymore? I'll just cut my dick off now. We know that's coming next. Nobody's asking the police to abandon their communities. People are asking the police to treat all communities like it is their community. I mean, think about it. The fact that this guy even says, we can't even put our hands on a criminal, that's part of the problem. All too often in America, police treat everyone that they come across like a criminal, especially black people. And I'm not being dramatic. That's just how it is. Now, for those who don't know, police unions fight for their members in the ways that all unions do, right? They organize for better pay and they organize for benefits. There are a lot of good things that come from having a police union, but they also protect members in ways that make it virtually impossible to hold bad cops accountable. They set the terms of internal investigations that accused cops can stonewall until the department has to give up. And then if a cop is found to be at fault, unions can put limits on the penalties so that even police chiefs who want to fire the officers who've done something wrong can't do it. And on top of all of that, there are even examples of police threatening not to do their jobs if politicians try to hold them accountable, which I'm sorry, is ridiculous. Can you imagine if nurses threaten to let patients die if they're not allowed to steal opioids and sell them on the side? No one would accept that. And so the question is, what can Americans do? If police unions are this powerful, what can people do? Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our very own union expert, Roy Wood Jr. What's going on, Roy? How you doing? What's up, man? How you been? Uh, well, I'm, I'm as good as I can be, and I'm assuming you've seen that video of Pat Lynch you know, the head of the, the, the New York Police Union. What, what did you make of the video? Yes, I saw Henry Winkler up there at the microphone doing his thing. Looked like Henry Winkler. I, I thought it was a Happy Days reboot. I was like, this is a terrible time to bring back this show. Also, sidebar, if, if you're a police union and you vote somebody to be the head of the police union, you probably shouldn't have them be named Pat Lynch. Also, big question, Trevor, where are the rest of the black people that are on this diverse police department? Look at this photo. That look like a 50-year reunion of a lacrosse team. Yeah, and, and Roy, another problem is that the police unions are now basically showing people what a powerful force they are. They're standing up against the reforms and, and they're so well organized that politicians are afraid of them. So, like, the question I have for you is, is there anything that can be done to weaken the influence they have See, 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 African, you're thinking about it wrong, man. See, here's the thing. Everybody's trying to make the police union weaker, when all you need to do is make a stronger union that's stronger than the police union. That's why I propose that all black people come together and we form a black people union. It's called the National Black Association. Wait, hold up. The NBA? Shit, man, I can think of another name. Look, the point is, is that once this union is together, it brings together every black person in the country. And if you're black, you're automatically approved. It's the opposite of a home loan. Okay, fine. And then what happens once you have the black union? How does that help? Once we're organized, every year we'll make America negotiate a new deal with us. And with our strength in numbers, we can finally get our demands met hold cops accountable for misconduct, demilitarize the police, shift funding away from cops and towards schools and education, and while we're at it, rescue Kanye West from the sunken place. We need him back, man. Okay, look, Roy, that sounds like fair demands, but what if America and the black union can't agree on a deal? What happens then? Well, then black people will just have to take our talents elsewhere. Like when LeBron left Cleveland, only now it's black people leaving all of America. Does America really want that? 
Do you really want to be without black people? No sports, no music, no more dance moves. Y'all going to be on TikTok doing the hokey pokey after we leave. Good luck going viral with that shit. I, I don't know, Roy. I don't know. If, if black people leave America, where will they go? We'll go anywhere. Maybe we'll go to one of them countries that doesn't have any police brutality. You know, uh, uh, Japan, there's, um, there's New Zealand, there's, um, what's, the, what's the white one? Norway. You can go to Norway. Well, you know what? I don't think we should go to Norway because I know winter up there is brutal. That's a whole different type of brutality to black people. So we'll just go to Japan. And by the way, when we do leave America, we'll get ourselves there. We don't need you offering no boat rides. We ain't falling for that no more. Uh-uh. Travel vouchers only. Now, if you'll excuse me, Trevor, I need to check on these 50,000 business cards that I ordered that said NBA on them. See if I can get those canceled. Hey, what's up, man? You know, with all these protests sweeping across America, people have been comparing this moment to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And much like the 1960s, law enforcement officers have met these calls to end police brutality with even more police brutality. Across the country, peaceful protests have too often devolved into standoffs with heavily armed police using military-style tactics. Flashbangs, tear gas, rubber bullets, helicopters, armored vehicles. Law enforcement in riot gear approach a barrier. Protesters on the other side, hands up in the air, chanting, don't shoot. Don't shoot. But that's exactly what they did, shooting tear gas and rubber bullets. The threat of terrorism after 9-11 convinced many departments to stock up. Now, those departments are facing off against their own citizens. Just take a moment to think about that. The police department got this heavy-duty equipment to fight terrorists. That's why they got the equipment post 9-11. And now they're using it against Americans who are exercising their right to protest. And I'm, I'm sorry, what about these people screams terrorist to you? Like maybe I've forgotten my history, but I don't remember the part where Al Qaeda attacked America with cardboard signs. And an argument I've heard some people make is that the only reason the police are doing this is because the protesters are looting or being violent. That's what they say. No, they're doing this because the people are violent. But as happens so often, the police's story never matches the actual footage. Because for the past week, the internet has been full of videos of police officers attacking protesters with no provocation whatsoever. Caught on camera from coast to coast, alleged excessive force by police officers. Attacks against protesters who were demonstrating against police brutality. In New York, police drove a vehicle into a crowd of people protesting there. In Los Angeles, police swing batons at people who witnesses say were simply standing with their hands up. A New York police officer caught on camera pushing a woman who was demonstrating. An officer pulling a man's face mask off and spraying him with pepper spray. This unsettling image of an officer kicking a woman who was maced. Caught on camera, a protester run over by an HPD mounted patrol unit at the height of the protests. We as black people deal with this every day. Black and brown people are treated brutally every day. I don't care who you are, those images have to be upsetting to watch. Because these images are the antitheses of what America is supposed to stand for, right? This is supposed to be the country where you have the freedom to say whatever you want, a democracy, right? You can say whatever you want, whether it's Black Lives Matter or let's all drink bleach. The government is not supposed to physically punish you for that. And that hasn't always been the case in America, but that is the ideal, right? When people were protesting in Michigan, saying that they wanna go out, they wanna go back to work, they wanna get haircuts, they don't care about the coronavirus, they weren't getting beaten up. And that's what America is, the freedom to protest. And the freedom to protest isn't the only American ideal that the police have been trying to suppress lately. It seems like they've been really making a concerted effort to go after the free press. More than 300 journalists have faced press freedom violations. Across the United States, the camera is rolling when law enforcement seem to be targeting journalists. I am press. Please. <laughs> we identified ourselves as press and they um, fired 
tear gas canisters on us at point blank range. This Australian cameraman and reporter were shoved and hit while live on air. Police now advancing on protest. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're moving, we're moving. I'm getting shot, I'm getting... In Louisville, pepper balls fired at a crew on live TV. Okay. Who were they the aiming that at? At Sorry. us, like directly at us. Yeah. Those videos are what's happening in America right now. Cops are just openly firing tear gas and pepper bullets and everything on journalists. And I mean, I can't blame them. If I was doing the shit that the police have been doing, I wouldn't want anyone recording it either. So the police are attacking unarmed protesters, defenseless reporters. I mean, at this point, you might be wondering, is there anyone? Is there anyone non-threatening enough that the police would not get violent with them? And what we're learning is that the answer is no. A Salt Lake City police officer in full riot gear using his shield to push an elderly man with a cane. The man falls face first onto the ground. Two officers in Buffalo, New York, pushing a 75-year-old man who falls to the ground, hits his head, and starts bleeding. None of the officers in the video appear to help him. I don't care how many times I see that video, I will never get used to it. Because it's bad enough that these cops push an old man who's walking over to them. But the fact that they walk over him, they walk past him while he's bleeding out on the sidewalk. Like, who are you protecting and serving if not that old man? And think about it. These were just two that were caught on video. Now, as usual, when videos like this come out, the excuse is always the same. People always want to defend those police by saying, those are just a couple of bad apples. That is not, that is not a signifier, that is, that is not representative of the entire police department. The only issue is that argument falls apart when you see what happened after they pushed this old man to the ground. A police statement released before the footage was posted online said only that a man tripped and fell. But after the video surfaced, the police commissioner ordered an internal affairs investigation and the immediate suspension of the officers without pay. As the officers leave the courthouse, cheers from a crowd of fellow officers and law enforcement. In another show of support, all 57 members of the Buffalo Emergency Response Team resigned, but they remain on the police force. Think about this for a second. Not only did the police department try to cover up what happened, not only did they try and lie about something that we all saw on camera, but once the truth got out and those cops were punished, the entire team resigned to protest those police being held accountable. In fact, they even showed up at the courthouse to cheer them on as they came out. What are you cheering? That Buffalo is finally safe? from old men walking around in public? What are you cheering? What are you cheering? The fact that you've come out? The fact that you stayed... Like, it's a scary thing to think about. What are they cheering for? And something I think people need to understand about the police is that, in a way, they have the same code that a gang does, in that, above all, you are loyal to your crew. That is a culture that is within every police department. And that's the heart of this issue. If good police are willing to look the other way or even join in when the bad police abuse their powers, you can make new rules and regulations all you want, but it won't matter. America's not gonna be able to fix this problem until we have police whose first priority is protecting and serving the people instead of protecting and serving themselves. In 2020, thousands of people marched in the streets trying to defund the police, which sounds scary, but what does it actually mean? This really is a, an idea to entirely reimagine public safety and rethink how we do it. It means taking money out of police budgets and using it to fund different types of workers who handle some 911 calls, kind of like how Batman had to take a pay cut to fund the Justice League. And in Eugene, Oregon, they're giving it a trial run with a program called CAHOOTS. CAHOOTS? What is that? Like a crime-solving owl? CAHOOTS is an acronym. It stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. Okay, so no owl. I sat down with CAHOOTS coordinators, Tim Black and Ebony Morgan, to find out how their little test project has been going. So I'm guessing you guys started CAHOOTS a few months ago when everybody was marching in the streets. No. We've actually been around for more than 30 years. Wait, hey. 
30 years? When your organization was created, the Fresh Prince hadn't even left for Bel Air yet. Okay, they've been doing this for a while, but what exactly are they doing? What type of 911 calls do you all typically respond to as a Cahoots agent? Is it agent, a Cahooter, a Cahooty? We respond to non-criminal and non-violent calls for service um, that come through the 911 line in our area. And we respond with a crisis worker and an EMT instead of law enforcement. You still got guns though, right? No guns, no tasers, no pepper spray. You got nunchucks, ninja stars, sword, baseball bat. Why is it that we assume it's going to take a weapon to get somebody up off of you? Hey, I hear what you're saying, Tim, but like even mall cops got mace and they protect and build a bear workshop. But where other law enforcement officers are utilizing more and more expensive military gear, cahoots in their little white vans actually save a ton of money. Compared to the local police's annual budget of 90 million, Cahoots cost about 2 million, around 2% of the police budget. But Cahoots responds to almost 20% of emergency calls. So what does a typical Cahoots call look like? It's really about meeting people where they are and helping them get to a space that's maybe a little safer. Say we started talking on the side of the road and it's noisy and you're overwhelmed. Let's just have a seat in the back of the van and then we'll talk that's about kidnapping. it. That's kidnapping. That's <laughs> kidnapping, Ebony. Not if they respectfully, that's kidnapping. I do promise people snacks if they get in sometimes. What kind of snacks you got? Granola bars, some water, whatever. We'll have clothes on the van, tents, sleeping bags. I'm gonna just be honest. You had me at snacks. I'm a 40 year old man. I'll get in the van for some snacks. But besides the granola bars, they have one big secret weapon just being chill using a technique they call de escalation. De escalation is a practice where you're encountering somebody who is escalated and you help them get to a de-escalated space or a little more calm. So what's the de-escalated version of pepper spray? Like Tabasco sauce and you just flick that in somebody's eye? Oh. No. I need to be engaged. I need to show you that I really care about the things that you're saying and finding that way that we can work through this crisis together. But lately, Cahooters have been putting their lives on the line responding to Karens. Oh, America's angriest and most dangerous demographic. You know, we get a lot of calls um, that are placed to public safety with a certain outcome in mind. Those calls. You say racism, place. Tim? Tim, <laughs> this is a safe place? All right. We have a lot of people that, you know, we, we do encounter situations where folks are calling in, um, you know, because of racist motivations or, uh, you know, because they have a bias against different socioeconomic circumstances. And in those situations, I think there are two things that we need to do. One is we need to recognize what it was that triggered that person to make that call. And that if they're and still on two, scene. Slap the shit out of them. Or, you know, maybe try and, and present an opportunity for them to confront a little bit of their white fragility. Um, you know, a little bit okay, of that explicit bias. I was going to say that next. But then, you know, also with the other, with the individual that we we're called out to respond to, you know, we have an obligation to say, Hey, like this, this was unfair. We know that you didn't ask us to be here. We're here now. Is there anything that we can do for you? So essentially Karen calls 911 for protection from the homeless person. And then y'all pull up and protect the homeless person from Karen. Basically and then offer them snacks. Exactly. Cahoots is out there helping the homeless and trolling Karens, but I had to see it in action, in a COVID safe way, of course, without leaving my home. You aren't the cops. Technically, I can get a hold of the police, but I would only do so if somebody was unsafe, and I'm not necessarily seeing I that unsafe. unsafe right now. I was so scared that Martin Luther King Jr. statue across the street has been staring at me. Can you go say something to it, please? Well, maybe. I'm here to talk with you right now, though. Um, how long has this been going on for you? Every day. Every day I come down the street and it's just a black guy and he's just staring at me. Where are the cops? Where's your gun? Where's all of your stuff? I don't see a threat oh in this immediate situation. Do you feel like I bet you don't. right now? I bet you don't. I bet you know him. Ah, you people. What if you walked down a different block? What if you put the statue in a different place, okay? Well, I'm not in charge of statue placement but I am here to help you have a better day. And if this is gonna ruin your day, you don't have to look at it. Wow, these guys are good. And if Cahoots could do all of this with $2 million, imagine what they could do with 90. Incredible. Hootie hoo.